Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson, your host from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit that supports human evolution research and shares discoveries. Today, we explore the amazing things rocks can tell us about our past. Before we dig deeper, though, thank you to the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, who made today's episode possible. Now, let's bring on our guests the very first recipient of the Leakey Foundation's Francis H. Brown African Scholarship, Dr. Patrick Gathogo. Patrick, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you also, it's an honor. Patrick originally hails from Kenya and joins us today from Houston. Patrick is an adjunct associate professor at the University of Utah, associate research professor at Stony Brook University, and associate researcher in the geology department of the National Museums of Kenya. His, works take, uh, his work has taken him to sites all over Africa with his core research focused on the Lake Turkana region where we are zooming in right now and he'll be discussing this during his talk or oh, actually during the whole episode. Before we hear from Patrick, if you are watching this episode live, Please post comments or questions for Patrick in the chat and he'll be answering them live during the episode. The earlier you get those questions in, the more likely your question may be featured. Patrick, I just, I love learning new things from guests and I learned something new from you. What is petrology? So petrology is the detailed uh, study of rock materials, uh, minerals and uh, organic material and also mineralized uh, fossil remains. So, and we usually use a microscope and other methods to look at things at a very, very detailed level. So it's almost like a, a molecular biology or DNA of, uh, for the geologist. Yeah, like I think, I think you, you, you mentioned in, when we first met, when you were describing it to me, it was like the genetics of rocks, which yeah. I think is, is such a cool thing. So yeah. like, you know, like when we think of, of, of it, what are some like examples like of, of what you're looking at when you're thinking of petrology? So, so in petrology, we, we can just take a piece of rock and slice it almost to the thickness, uh, a third of the thickness of a human hair and look through it. And we'll be able to see minerals, um, very small microscopic features. And uh, to some extent, we can even see um, things that are smaller, almost the size of bacteria or virus. Wow because that's, that's really tell us how they, it, it gives an opportunity to understand how the rocks behave because those are the basic building blocks. Oh, it's so cool. So what, like what, what's, what are we seeing in this one? So here we are actually seeing some kind of, uh, uh, these are quartz crystals. So you are seeing them under the microscope and they are showing you uh, like the bath marks and uh, in, in genetic material that, uh, differentiate each uh, minerals and how it was formed. I need to see them so close. Yeah. So what are, you've worked on a number of projects. What are some of your favorite projects? So some of my favorite projects are, are actually from the Tukana Basin. Uh, and one of them involved the discovery of uh, uh, Kenyandropas blood tubes, uh, which is uh, from, uh, yeah. Lomekui area uh, together with Dr. Mivliki. And uh, that, that was even before I, I did my uh, undergraduate uh, degree with uh, Frank Brown. So, so that's one of them. And there's another one uh, from uh, the Ilerech uh, region uh, where I, I also helped with the discovery of another uh, hominid. So, so those are some of the most uh, memorable findings that have been associated with, yeah. Oh, and then I, what is th this is this is back at Lomekwi. So this is back at Lomekwi. Uh, I was an undergraduate student there with uh, with Frank Brown, and uh, there's something very unique about Lomekwi, which I will discuss later, uh, because of the comparison uh, that it has with uh, uh, South Tarquil, which is the area that was funded by the Leakey Foundation. So, in addition to your, uh, you know, the research you do, you also do cons uh, consultation work. What is the role of a consultant? So, so for the consulting work that I do, I, I, I've been working as a reservoir petrologist 
and it's a very interesting relationship with uh, Frank Brown because uh, he was a petrologist. And most of the students, his students who pursued the pet petrology area ended up working in the oil and gas industry because petrology is very, very useful tool in the industry. Uh, so, so, but the knowledge is transferable. Some of what we learn in the oil and gas can also be used uh, in, in the study of human evolution. And that is what Frank uh, used to do a lot. You, you mentioned Frank. Um, uh, I guess, uh, who is Frank and who were your other mentors? So Frank Brown with, was my academic advisor and mentor. I worked with him uh, in, in Turkana Basin for a very long time. And uh, my other mentor was uh, Miv Liki, uh, who is pictured there uh, next to me. And uh, so, so those were my, uh, my main mentors. And Miv Liki is still uh, my mentor and, and Richard Liki also used to be my mentor. Oh, that's a great group of mentors to ha uh, have. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Frank Brown was co-chair of the Leakey Foundation's Scientific Executive Committee until his untimely death in, uh, in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Leakey Foundation and Frank's daughters, Erica Brown Ursoy, or Elise Brown Ursoy and Erica Brown Gaddis, uh, established the Francis H. Brown African Scholarship Fund to fulfill Frank's wishes to provide financial assistance to uh, East African researchers and students pursuing research in earth sciences and botany related to human origins. Uh, Erica and Elise, who are now board members of the Leakey Foundation, are so excited that we're featuring you on Lunch Break Science and uh, sent a question for you. They asked, what are the areas of research that you are most interested in pursuing? And how did the Francis H. Brown African Scholarship help you prepare for this work? Uh, so my main area that I'm interested in and which I think I, I really have been able to contribute a lot as far as the human evolution studies are concerned is the application of petrology uh, for the study of geology in, in, uh, in East Africa and particularly to use the knowledge that I've gained in the industry and try to use it uh, in the Turkana Basin. And uh, the, the funding that I got from the Leakey Foundation was actually very, very important because it gives me a head start to start applying that kind of technology at uh, South Tarquil area. And it was a very critical site because uh, that's a project that uh, Frank Brown had already started. And uh, before he passed away, he was not able to, to finish it. So I was um, sort of uh, left with that responsibility of completing it. And uh, the, the funding helped me uh, to do a lot of analysis, which would otherwise been very difficult to justify. In honor of Frank Brown's birthday this month, his daughters, Erica and Elise, are matching donations to the Francis H. Brown African Scholarship. The way that this works is if you donate $25, your donation will have uh, be matched and have $50 worth of impact. We are excited to help the next generation of East African scientists, just like Patrick, and hope that you will help us too. We've shared a link in the chat to learn more about the program. We just wanna thank Erica and Elise so much for this generous contribution. Patrick, mentorship has been clearly a very important part of your career. What are you doing to mentor the next generation of scientists? So I, geology student, um, one of the, the things that um, Frank told me when he, he took me on as a student is sometimes geology can be very difficult and it's very important that you get students very early uh, and, and be able to take them through uh, research and all the activities involved. So what I do also is try to get uh, involved with students, uh, even undergraduates, uh, and try to give them the experience in the field so that I can uh, increase their, their curiosity, as particularly in the area of geology. So um, I'm mentoring several uh, African students. Uh, they're going to the local universities. Um, so, so that's what I've been doing. And every time I have a chance to go to the field, I try to work with our students whether they are geology majors or not, uh, because geology is can be applicable in even in other areas, archaeology, paleontology, and uh, as long as you're dealing with rocks. So 
I mean, geology, it, you know, I think it's not something we, we've featured too many times on Lunch Break Science, but what, what was it about geology that really interested you in pursuing that? Actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting story because as I was growing up uh, as a student in Kenya, I used to see th uh, this news about discoveries of, uh, of uh, a lot of very strange looking uh, animals or fossils, they called them. And when I went to the museum, they basically looked like rock. So I was very much interested to see what kind of soil they have in Chukana that could be able to be preserving these uh, sediments. And when I met Frank, it, 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 he was almost like a magician. He could look at the rocks, you know, tell the, whether it was a river or a lake, and I really wanted to have the ability to understand that. So, so that's what got me very, very interested in rocks, uh, being able to read them like you can read a textbook and be able to see a lot of things that other people would not be able to see. I just, I really, I cannot, I cannot wait to actually jump into your talk. So we're, we're going to turn the virtual floor over to you very shortly. But before we do that, if you want to learn more about human evolution, amazing research going on all over the world, and the latest discoveries, start by subscribing to the Leaky Foundation's YouTube channel and clicking the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Now, let's turn the virtual floor over to Patrick and hear more about his research. So I'll, I'll, uh, it's a presentation that combines uh, a lot of things that I've uh, done with uh, Frank Brown and some of the work that I've continued uh, since uh, he passed away and what I, I plan to, to pursue. So in the presentation, I'll mostly discuss about the geologic context of, uh, of the Trukana Basin in terms of uh, understanding the Rift Valley, because that's very important to understand what has been happening in the basin. And then I'll focus more on the uh, South Tarkwell site, which is a site that I was uh, funded by the Leakey Foundation uh, to, to do some petrology study. And some of the challenges that we still face even up to date uh, in terms of geochronology. And then I'll talk about the application of uh, some of the techniques that I have developed in the oil and gas industry to uh, our studies on, on uh, humans evolution. So to start with, uh, so this is the location of uh, the Trukana Basin uh, at the center there. And what you notice is that in East Africa, we have a very highest concentration of huge lakes and they're basically aligned along the reef system. It's a, it's a very active reef system. It's basically pulling apart at the rate at which your fingernails and toenails uh, grow. So, so, and associated with that, you have a lot of faulting, which are the source of the big lakes and a lot of volcan volcanic centers. And, um, and it, it sort of has a customized uh, uh, climate and, and flora and fauna, because even though it's near the equator, the topography from the rift has changed a lot of things that, uh, that we see presently in East Africa. So that's the main context. And I always try to give people a perspective of how big the Tukana Basin is. And in this map, I place it next to the map of the US showing uh, the state of California. And you can see the drainage basin of, um, of the Tukana Basin. If you place it to the northern border, it will almost reach uh, some, uh, Los Angeles to the south. So it's a really huge basin. And uh, Frank always used to tell me, you can have a hundred geologists working there, mapping the basin, and they will never run out of work by the time they retire, if they start as students. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, geologists doing that kind of work. And that's why Frank Brown uh, uh, laid a lot of emphasis in trying to support our students who would be doing uh, field geology and botany. So, so, so the work in the Trukana Basin, uh, more than what we understand right now, began in the 60s uh, from the OMO expedition. And above there, you can see the first team of uh, experts with uh, Frank Brown uh, uh, at the back row there. So they did a lot of work and uh, Frank Brown as a student started mapping uh, the geology of the area and he developed a method where he could use volcanic ashes that are from the eruption and find some uh, chemical signature. And then he would use them as stratigraphic markers. 
And together with volcanic ashes, he would look at the crystals that were erupted during the same eruption. Uh, and he would uh, get uh, isotopic date from the crystals. So that way you have a combination of stratigraphic markers and the exact age of the volcanic ash eruption. And this is the map that he came up with. So he was able to develop a, a tephrostratigraphy, which is using volcanic ash layers, and chronostratigraphy using the crystals from the same eruption to get the age. Uh, and you can see here, he was able to create a very good map of the area uh, in the early uh, 80s uh, that we still use up to date. And the ages are shown on the right there, ranging all the way from 4 million years uh, up to present. And uh, the, the, the ashes that were used uh, for dating. OK. So in, a lot of work has been done in the basin uh, since then, and a lot of it uh, has a lot to do with uh, his contribution. And uh, I was lucky to be involved in some of the work that he did. And you can see there on the on map on the left, um, the mapping includes not just the outcrop on the surface, but the sediment uh, below the surface. Uh, and you can see most some of those sediments go up to 4,000 meters uh, below the, the, the surface. And it's, it's mostly uh, a system uh, that, that is associated with drifting. So they create a uh, scarp. You have a crack on the earth, and then there is a, a displacement along that crack, which re result to formation of a fault. And then you have something that is almost like a swimming pool. And the deep end will be very near the fault scarp, and the shallow end will be on the opposite side. And that's what we call half grab end. And you can see in the green area in the middle of the lake, they keep they're switching back and forth, left and right. So a series of those uh, major faults. Uh, so that has played a very important uh, role in understanding what has been happening in the basin. And even the most important thing is to know when some of these events have been happening. Uh, so, so, and if you know when they have been happening, that it becomes very easy for you to do prospecting and look for other uh, new deposits, uh, because uh, that is what we want to be able to do as geologists, is to expand the area where we can look for fossils. And, uh, and even though uh, for the last um, uh, 50 or so years, a lot of work has been done in the Tukana Basin, um, and Frank has been able to, to do analysis of uh, more than uh, 2,500 uh, samples of volcanic ashes. And there on the right, you can see, on the left, you can see that a chart that shows the, the stratigraphic markers uh, with their ages that have, have been identified across the basin. And they range all the way from isotopic ages, from uh, first, uh, crystals uh, to paleomag uh, dating, which was actually developed from uh, mediocenic uh, uh, spreading ridges. And it was also applied in the Tukana Basin. So there are very many methods that we, we have been able to use uh, for, for dating uh, the, the layers of deposit in the Tukana Basin. And um, when we tell people that we still have challenges with geochronology in the Tukana Basin, it's really hard for them to believe because we have basically the best dated uh, stratigraphic interval for, for Pliocene and Pleistocene. But we still have difficulties and for example, the example that I'm going to give for uh, South Tuckwell is a, is a very good um, illustration of that. And the common lim limitations for doing that uh, are usually associated with uh, you know, sample processing and selection, because sometimes if you're not very careful and uh, you process the samples or when you're doing analysis, you remove some of the important components of, of, of those uh, volcanic caches, then you will end up with the biased uh, results. And that's why this method, when Frank Brown was developing it, he developed it together with uh, uh, petrology techniques that you would be able to use to clean the volcanic ashes so that you're not taking away some important components. And it is from that method that he moved from uh, the initially known about four tufts that were believed to be in the basin to what we have now, up to 380 volcanic ashes. Um, and then sometimes you might not be able to get a lot of help from uh, absolute dating method where you take a sample and put it in a machine and then you get a number. 
sometimes you just have to go to the field and use the traditional method of uh, dating for you to get a better age. And that is very well illustrated by the method that uh, Frank used for dating uh, one of the basalts in the basin. Uh, and I'll talk about it briefly. So you have to, uh, to put the geologic context, uh, your samples, before you can be able to come up with a good age. And sometimes you have strata that are just floating. They are bound between falls, and you don't have a stratigraphic marker that you can be able to use for dating. And that's also the, the case that we have uh, with, uh, with the Illerate, with southern uh, South Tarkwell area. So, and uh, the method that I described, um, the traditional way of uh, doing dating, which is called a physical stratigraphic dating method, you basically go into the field and making observation and collecting physical evidences and inferring relationship between various features that you see, faults, uh, basalts, uh, you know, all sorts of sediments, and you can be able to come up with a very good, uh, uh, better estimate of, uh, of the age. So and, and in this method, you rely very much on the petrology technique. And, uh, and sometimes some of the things that you see, like uh, the picture there on the right, are very, very simple observation can really be help you to resolve the date, the age of some of these events. Uh, uh, so, and that's what I'll be illustrating. So, and this, this shows how powerful petrology is, and that's why I'm excited to be able to, uh, to use that uh, technique in order to uh, enhance the, under, our understanding of the Tukana Basin geology. So, and this is an example that um, Frank used to give to people, and I still like giving this example. And the example was the Gombe group basalt that are shown there, and that's me standing uh, in front of some very beautiful columnar basalt. They used to puzzle Frank for a very long time, because when you look at them, they are petrologically similar in terms of the minerals, and, and that means they basically formed in the same area, they, they, they're basically uh, same family. But the ages were very, very different that we were getting from uh, from lab measurements. They range from 3.5 million years and even about 5 million years. So a very, very big variation. And that that was a problem until, uh, and I was there when this happened. Uh, we went to the field with Frank, and we made the observation that is uh, shown there on the right, and that was the contact between the basalt and the lake sediment, and we noticed that the contact was chilled, okay? So that means the basalt came in when it was very hot and it intruded into uh, lake deposits. And we went all over the basin for the next three or four uh, years, taking samples of those basalt. And finally, we were able to confine them to about uh, four million years, just by using that relationship that we were observing the field. And, and that's an example to show that sometimes you can't just rely on calculation that you uh, you get uh, from the lab based on isotope. Uh, you could be having a problem with a, a mineral a transformation that you might not be able to identify when you're sampling. So, and we were able to develop a story of actually how the basin formed four million years ago and how the rift tectonics, you know, the diagram shown below there you have a crack starting to form as the basin is pulling apart because we are within the rift valley. And then when the faults, the, the cracks go deep enough, then they slide against one another. And then you start having some kind of a swimming pool, kind of a basin uh, with a deep end near the big fault. And then a lake would start to form. And that is the lake that you see there on the, on the right. And soon enough, uh, the basalts uh, will start, uh, the magma will start uh, uh, melting uh, at the bottom and then it will be ejected out through some of those faults. And that's why we have very widespread uh, basalt volcanism in the basin taking place within a very, very short period of time. So, and by that kind of understanding shows how powerful just using simple techniques, observation in the field can be able to help you to come up with a very, very good dating. Uh, method, uh, an alternative uh, to, to the absolute lab dating method. So, so one of the two areas that uh, Frank Brown was very interested in, with when I met him was uh, the Lomekwi area where Kenyandropause were discovered, 
and the South Turkwell area, which is shown here on the on the right, because it represented a time interval where we did not have a lake above the Lokacho Turf. So that gave uh, as an, uh, a very good area where we could see what was happening with the hominids and other animals that we were living during that time interval. So, and there are a lot of similarities that we saw between uh, the Lomekwi area and the South Tarkwell area. Uh, one of them is the, is the turf, uh, uh, which is dated at 4.2 million years old. So, so the lake was there, so it's, it's in both areas. And the Lokacho turf was in both areas. And in both areas, the, the lake, the rivers, the turf is overlain by uh, fluvio or river deposits. And there were a lot of fossils that were coming there from there. And then uh, we saw evidence that there was a big river, which is the main Omo River, and some other river that were developing from the site, which is now the ancient uh, Tarquil River. But the challenge with the, with the South Tarquil area is that the hominid were coming uh, from the area that is shown there with a star. It's bounded on the left and the right by two major faults. And the only uh, specimen that we saw there, marker bed that we saw there was a volcanic cache, which is here uh, described as the Patrick stuff. And then one year later, they made a very, very important discovery of fossil from very near where that volcanic cache is. So we realized that we have to, to really try and understand the age of, uh, of that would be very, very important. And uh, that is what uh, Frank Brown was doing um, for, for a while uh, until he passed away. And um, after that, I, I took over uh, the project to try and, uh, and finish it. And this, uh, these are some of the, 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 the final uh, uh, conclusion that uh, he came up with and which my work uh, supports. And uh, so he was able to create some kind of relationship between the, 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 the different blocks uh, that are faulted. Uh, the Western block, which is we know very well because there's a volcanic ash there for, for 4.2 million years old, which is shown there on the, on the right. And the middle blo block where the fossil came, come from, there was the volcanic ash, which is called the Patrick's ash. We were not able to find anything we could date, and it did not correlate with anything that we know in the basin. So that was problematic. But on the block to the right, which is where the locature is, we knew the age of that because of the locature turf. So we had to use petrology. I had to use petrology in order for me to try and see whether the, the, the hominy block is sourcing sediment from the same area at the block to the east and the block to the west. So that way you can link them just based on the Petrology of the sediments that they are carrying, and the results that are found so uh, come up with so far, it shows that the, it's very consistent with what we see at at Lome, uh, uh, the Lomekwi area, and also what we expect to see here in the in South Tarkwell. So it means that uh, that section actually lies between the the, the Lomnion Lake of 4.0. Two million years, and the locator turf, which is 3.6 million years, and the other methods that were tried, including Palimag, were, were very conclusive. And so far, I'm very confident that uh, the petrology finding are uh, going to hold uh, in this case. And uh, these are the, the results from the volcanic ash uh, that we got from there. So the Patrick's volcanic ash. So it's a very, very unique volcanic ash. It doesn't match any of the 2,500 samples of volcanic ash that we have from the basin. And it's very interesting because it has two modes. There are several other tasks that have two modes, and one of, one of them is Lokochoch. But this is definitely not the Lokochoch because of the chemistry. So that eliminates that, that correlation. And there was an attempt to correlate it with the local tough, which is about 2.5 million years. but the local letter has only one mode. So if you try to ignore the other mode, uh, that might lead to very misleading uh, interpretation, just the same way we had with the KVS tough controversy. So any correlation that we 
we will do on this volcanic ash, we have to identify the two modes. And the closest match was a, a volcanic ash that I collected at Luangalani area, which is to the southeast, to, to the south, um, yes, south uh, east, marked there as LN. And it's also uh, early Pliocene. And there's another one from uh, Ilaret, which is to the northeast. And it's, it also has two, two modes, and uh, it's also early Pliocene. So everything is just indicating that this uh, block, the hominid block, uh, would be uh, uh, early Pliocene uh, more than anything else. So, so, and, um, so concluding, uh, one of the things that I plan uh, to continue doing is uh, continue using petrology. Uh, and expand it to other areas that we, we, we could be able to use uh, uh, because it's used extensively in the oil and gas industry. A lot, a lot, a lot for geochronology, for deposition environment, for a lot of things, because sometimes what the only thing that they get are very small pieces of rocks uh, from, from the drilling process. Some of them are almost the size of a bean or, or, or a peanut. And uh, with petrology, that's not a problem because you can still be able to get a lot of information from that. And petrology can be used to uh, together for, for it can give results that uh, can be used for geochemistry and um, the physical uh, aspect, textures, even electrical properties, and even biological because you can be able to see microfossils. And that is how most of the old rocks, including oil and gas reef reservoirs are dated. They are dated based on microfossils that they identify using uh, petrology uh, tools. And um, so there is basically no limitation in terms of the size or even the kind of alteration uh, of the sample. Uh, and, and alteration can be a problem when you're trying to uh, date even basalts and other rocks. That's why we get uh, erroneous uh, dates out of them. And um, Currently, we are planning to develop a petrology lab uh, with the Tukana Basin Institute in the field and uh, equip, it, equip it so that people can be able to do very simple analysis because there are some analysis that you can already be able to do in the field, even without uh, taking the samples to the lab. So, and then the other one is uh, trying to, to, to uh, extend the application of petrology, not just for stratigraphy, and mapping outcrop geology, but also getting the provenance of the sediment and also studying about uh, the preservation of fossils. Uh, in the pictures that uh, you see there on the right, you see that microorganism, we know from the industry, my experience in the industry, that microorganisms are very important in, term, in terms of transformation of uh, animal remains into fossil they will determine whether you're going to have the fossil silicified, uh, calcified, and together with the chemical components that are in the water. Uh, and some of them could be from the volcanic ashes. And you can see uh, um, one of my, uh, one of the students there holding a fossil wood uh, from the Ilaret area. The fossilization there is very different because the sediments there are mostly composed of volcanic ashes. And normally, uh, fossilization of wood would be silicification, as you can see there at the bottom. But there are also some other areas that we see where fossilization of the wood is from uh, calcite. Okay, and one of the example is in Miocene site, which is in the southern part of uh, the basin uh, area called Napodate. So, and there, when you look closely, you can start to see uh, those are some of the processes that you can be able to study very well using uh, petrology uh, tools. So, so the purpose is to extend the application of uh, petrology, not just to uh, geochronology, but also to other aspects of um, uh, understanding uh, of the fossils. Okay. So, and I think that's uh, that's my last slide. Um, yeah, that, that is my last slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating. I still feel like <laughs> like every time I talk to you, I learn so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we first we have we were going to get to our audiences or our viewers questions, but we have yeah. a comment um, yeah. that we will were uh, okay. Uh, Amelia says being able to go out into the field with Dr. Bethoga was incredible. Seeing some of the basalt deposits in person was amazing. So. <laughs> okay. 
yeah, 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 good to hear. <laughs> I'm sure you, I'm, it sounds like you probably have a lot of students who have, share a story. Yeah, yeah, that was my, one of the students. I'm very, very glad to hear that kind of comment. It uh, makes me proud and to know that whatever I'm doing is effective and I'm reaching, <laughs> reaching to the students. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the, the the field trip that I took to to the uh, uh, Napodet area where we have uh, calcified the wood material, a very very interesting type of preservation. And you're yeah. just back from the field, uh, from the Turkana Basin, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just got back from the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was it was um it was it was amazing that we were able to make this work in between your your busy schedule and being in the field, but um, but. If you are watching and have not submitted your question, be sure to get those questions into the chat right now. Let's uh, take our first question from our viewers. So uh, Jean has a question. Let's see here. Uh, she says, hello, Patrick. Uh, great visuals along with your discussion. How much time can you spend at Turkana? Uh, at the time, um... Usually I go there, uh, even if I just have two weeks, I, I try just to go there and maybe I can do something with this, so, so those two weeks, but I can also stay even up to two months and I try to go there as often as uh, possible. Yeah. We have another question uh, from Jean. Uh, what exactly is tough? Oh. So, so tough when you have a volcanic eruption, especially when the viscosity is, is very high. It's like when you when you shake soda pop, and then you open suddenly. So that kind of a very very fine um, uh, glass that produce is produced from the eruption is actually what end up being volcanic uh, is end up being tough, and it's mixed together with other sediment and transported along a river. So under the microscope is basically glass, tiny glasses. Yeah. <laughs> like, I want to say, like, is the tough tough? <laughs> okay, we'll get to our, our next question comes from H. Uh, H says, hi, Patrick. Can you tell us a little bit about how the pandemic affected your various projects? It, it, uh, it did affect a lot uh, because uh, we were not able to travel from the US uh, to the field, uh, even though TBI was uh, was open but it was uh, very difficult uh, to even move from Nairobi to the field uh, because everybody was panicked. So I ended up shifting a lot of my project, including this one uh, that was funded by the Leakey Foundation by at least a year. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you were able to get back out into the field and yeah. uh, you know can continue on with your work. Our next question uh, comes from Pete. Uh, Fantastic, fascinating. Thank you, Patrick. Can you tell when in the last few million years was the water level in the basin at its highest? Uh, the last uh, few million years. So the last time that we know the lake was uh, very high, uh, leave alone the, the, the last uh, 5,000 or 10,000 years, uh, is around uh, 300,000 years. And that's where uh, Charlo Mandi is working in the Nato de Marie area. And during that time, the, the, the lake actually drained to, to the Nile system in terms of going to the, to the, to the Indian Ocean. And, but there are several other times uh, within the last 4 million years that we know the lake has been really as big as uh, at that time. Yeah. One of them is 4 million years. So you, you had just mentioned the Nado de Mary uh, area and you've worked there as well. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what is going on in, in that spot now? So Nado de Mary area is really interesting because it's a time interval where we don't have a lot of sediments in the basin. So we, we have a gap. We don't know what is happening during that time interval. But that is the time interval between uh, what we have as, as ancient animals, including hominid, and then the modern anatomically looking human being so so and that's the time interval that Chalo is working and um, uh, Frank was also working there and I'm helping uh, with the geology um, with Chalo 
So, so that's a very, very, very time interval. The lake level was very high, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of things were very different. Uh, so we are getting to understand uh, how the basin looked that looked like at that time. Um, our next question comes from uh, Projek. Uh, an amazing lecture. Uh, I'm from India. India in India, there is a lot of animal fossils, but uh, are found. Uh, but there's a lack of hominin fossils. Why? Ah. <laughs> ah, I, I, I don't want to go into speculations, but uh, yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to try and understand why there are no hominids there. <laughs> but uh, it's a good yeah, well, question too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, we'll have to. We'll have to. We'll have to find somebody to answer that yeah, question for you. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> okay. Our next question for, is from Amelia. Uh, uh, Amelia says, we are, were actually just discussing uh, a question to ask. We know that formations are named based on their locality. We were wondering if Dr. Gothogo ever got the chance to name something himself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so not a formation. I've uh, gotten a chance to name uh, volcanic ashes. And, and actually, the one at um, uh, South Tarkville, Everybody calls it Patrick Stubb, but that's not a formal name. <laughs> so yeah, we will have to change its name to, to some local name once we publish it and we do the chemistry for it. And um, so I've gotten that uh, opportunity to name uh, various, in, including basalts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Amelia has another question, a follow-up question. Let's see here. Uh, Steve from TBI would like to know why it is so hard to figure out a date for the new hominid site, oh, yeah, it's it's because of its um it's, it's in an isolated block fault block, and uh, we don't have a stratigraphic marker within that fault block that we can relate to anything uh, within the basin. So and um, you you can try and uh, do polymark dating, but polymark tells you whether you're normal or reversed, and then you have to put that information in context. You have to have a tie line. Uh, that has a number uh, age to each. So that that is why it has been very difficult uh, to, to get a age estimate for that uh, hominid locality. Well, thank you, Amelia, Steve, and, to, and all our friends at the Takana Basin Institute for sending along some questions. Um, the, our next question comes from Brandon. Uh, are there any new technologies on the horizon that will improve geology research? Uh, equipment, yes. Uh, the, the, the equipment have been uh, uh, developing very rapidly, and the technology, a lot of that technology is becoming very, very much affordable. And, uh, and one of the technology that I, uh, we are exploring and using right now includes a micro CT uh, because it's non destructive and you can be able to look inside uh, a fossil without uh, breaking it. And, and when you combine it with other uh, tools, you can even be able to get some kind of a chemical distribution or mineral distribution and tie it to the sediments where it's coming from. So we'll be able, hopefully we'll be able to provenance uh, surface collection to, to the sediment using that kind of technology. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from Anne Marie. Uh, she said, good afternoon, Patrick. Great presentation. Seems like there's a theme here. They all like your presentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How does basalt cool into columns? Does it only happen above ground or can also happen under lake deposits? So, so uh, a lot of those uh, columnar basalts are usually uh, the ones we see uh, uh, on the surface. Okay. So, so and I think that's um, uh, from my examples that I know are usually eruption that get to the surface. Yeah. If they cool down, then they will form a very, very strange kind of uh, crystals to them. Yeah. Our, um, our next question comes from Lou. Uh, Lou asks, when will the Rift Valley get flooded by the sea? Ah, <laughs> yeah, that used to be a story uh, that was very, very, uh, uh, topic of a long time ago because they were saying because of all these basalts that we have uh, developing along the rift valley one day the eastern side and the western side will tear apart and we'll have an ocean in between because basalts usually form in the ocean floor so so there was that story 
but I think now the understanding is that that is not going to be an ocean floor. It's just a, a reef valley. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I'm glad that we want to get, get as many fossils out of there before yeah. anything like that would happen. Um, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I have a I have a last question for you. Because uh, yeah. we've talked a lot about about uh, your mentors and you know Frank Brown's legacy, what would you like to see your legacy being? Uh, <laughs> that's a very very difficult question. I think uh, I think is the uh, I think it's petrology. I want to be able to to, to see the people in the human evolution being able to see this, this use this kind the same kind of technology that is being used by the oil and gas industry because it's, it's mostly about uh, understanding and knowledge. So, so to an extent that we would be able to explore for a lot of very many sites, uh, even without having to go and walk directly in the field, uh, we could probably use um, uh, satellite images and drone to be able to do geological mapping uh, very easily and very fast. So, so, so I think uh, if I'm able to, to, to develop technology in petrology to be used to that extent that is being used by the uh, even construction industry, they use petrology a lot. Actually, some of the best paid petrology work in the construction industry because it happens that you can be able to know the mechanical material properties of rock by just looking at uh, being section samples and SEM. So I want to be able to bring this technology back to, to human evolution. So if I'm able to do that, I think uh, <laughs> that will be something that I will be very proud of. Yeah. Well, you know, you're going to have to keep us tuned, you know, yeah. and uh, and and keep keep us all posted. And we'd love to have you back to hear about what is next for you. Um, mm -hmm. But just thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick. Next time on Lunch Break Science, we'll uh, be meeting Dr. Marika Janayak and uh, be learning about her really fascinating works on diet adaptations and the microbiome. So please join us on November 17th for that program. Thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Thank you. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leakey Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund. Subscribe to the Leakey Foundation's YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or sign up for our newsletter to be the first to hear about exciting upcoming episodes and programs. Miss an episode of Lunch Break Science? Catch up on past episodes and browse our library of Leaky Foundation lectures on our YouTube channel. Still hungry for science and can't wait till our next episode? Check out Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation's award-winning podcast. Origin Stories is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Visit us at leakyfoundation.org to learn more about the Leaky Foundation, today's guest scientists, our educational programs, research grant and scholarship opportunities, human evolution news, and how you can help support human evolution research and programs like Lunch Break Science and much, much more. Thank you for watching and see you next time.